entitled RDOI Webinar Series. Welcome everyone. Today is a very, very special day. Today we are celebrating the anniversary, the 33rd anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we are so, so excited that you are joining us today at Audio Eye. My name is Mariela Paulino. My preferred gender pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am the advocacy and social media manager here at Audio Eye. I am a Hispanic woman with long black hair. I am wearing a black shirt that has the Audio Eye logo on the left side and the words Audio Eye. So it is a black shirt with a white logo and white letters. And in my background, you will see a dark blue background with the Disability Pride colors because Disability Pride Month is in July. And we are commemorating this month today for the 33rd anniversary of the ADA. I also have a hearing disability and I use something called a cochlear implant to hear. So today's a very special day for me and for many other people with disabilities all over the United States and all over the world. And we are going to be having quite, quite the conversation today. Before we get this party started, we are going to go over to the next slide and we are going to welcome Dominic Varakali, who is Audio Eyes Chief Operations Officer. Awesome. Thanks, Mariella, and thank you. I'm excited to be here with everyone. As Mariella mentioned, um, I'm Audio Eyes Chief Operating Officer. I am a white male wearing all black with black hair. I've got the same wonderful background that Mariella has. And I'm excited to be here today because we know that, you know, all kinds of businesses don't have the internal expertise um, or are able to remediate at the scale that's needed. Um, they're looking for partners to help drive those initiatives throughout the organization for all the content they have to give others equal access. And that's why I'm excited to be here on the 33rd anniversary of the ADA. And this is just one day after the Department of Justice advanced more rules to strengthen web and mobile accessibility for people with disabilities. The mission of the ADA has been to ensure equal rights and opportunities and access for people with all kinds of disabilities, and we're proud to support that initiative. So with this webinar, we're going to get to learn from some of our amazing team, including our Alliance community, from our CEO, and from a member of our board. Um, so I want to just thank everyone for joining uh, and really uh, appreciate you taking the time out. So with that, Marielle, I'm going to pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Dominic. So today marks a very special occasion, not only because we're celebrating the anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, but yesterday, yesterday, the Department of Justice released some really spicy, important information. Um, for the first time in the history of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Department of Justice issued a proposed rule on website accessibility. So what does this mean? This is a monumental, mon huge, significant step towards inclusivity and equal rights. And our esteemed guests, Tony Colo and David Morati, who are both known for their tireless efforts in championing this cause, are busy. Today, Tony Coelho, um, who is also a board member for Audio Eye, is at the White House celebrating the 33rd anniversary of the ADA, and our CEO is busy making moves. Uh, where CEO is currently meeting with teams both internally and externally to make sure that we are getting all of the information that we need so we can continue to deliver the highest standards of accessibility for our clients. And because their schedules were absolutely packed, we really wanted to make sure that we got them um, and we had a conversation with them. So we were incredibly fortunate to have a pre-recorded session, which we will be sharing in a little bit. We are also going to be joined today by Charles Heiser, who is an Audio Eye Alliance member um, and advocate. He has so much knowledge and expertise, and I am constantly learning from him. He's going to be sharing his expertise and knowledge and background 
with the history of the ADA. I am now going to pass the microphone and the stage over to my colleague, Charles. Are you ready to go? Yes, ma'am, I am. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. As Mariella said, my name is Charles Heiser. I am an Alliance team member at Audio I. We do accessibility testing and uh, compliance testing for websites and documents. I am also an, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm also a disability advocate at Audio I, and I have a disability myself. I'm blind and will be using screen reading technology to give this presentation. So uh, any pauses or hiccups are probably due to me listening to a voice and trying to talk at the same time. Um, I am a white male with dark brown hair. I am wearing a black suit jacket, sky blue shirt, and dark blue and black tie. Now, as Mariella said, today we are celebrating the 33rd anniversary of the ADA. So we put together a presentation talking about how we got here and where we're going. Now, the ADA begins not actually with the ADA, but with another law, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, specifically Section 504. Now, this is important because it's the first time that people with disabilities are legally seen as being able to be discriminated against. And we can see here with the picture of uh, the eight-year-old Jennifer Keelan, as well as many other individuals with disabilities, crawling up the steps of the Capitol to uh, bring light to disability rights and how important it is. Now, one important thing to note about Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act is that it only applies to businesses and government entities that receive federal funding. Public businesses or private businesses did not have to abide by this. Now we jump 10 years to 1988. This is when Senator Lowell Weicker and Senator Tom Harkins introduced the Americans with Disabilities Act in the Senate, S2345. This is the first draft of what we will know as the Americans with Disabilities Act that will get signed into law two years later. Now, simultaneously in the House, we'll view this in just a moment, there was another bill, same, same idea, drafted for the House of Representatives instead. If we move to the next slide, we can see pictures of Representatives Tony Coelho and Silvio Kant. You will hear a message from Tony later. It's very, very exciting. All of this was happening during the 100th session of Congress, a landmark event in American political history. And there was no better time to bring light to disabled rights than now. And it paid off. In 1990, July 26, 33 years ago today, George H.W. Bush signed the Americans with Disabilities Act into law. And this changed the direction of how disabled people are treated in this country today. It does this by a couple of things. Now, according to the way the ADA is written, it is a federal civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities in everyday activities. Some of the examples of a person with disability are somebody who has a physical or mental impairment, such as blindness, deafness, or a motor disability. Somebody who has a history or record of such an impairment, such as somebody who might be in remission from cancer or somebody who is perceived as having a disability, such as somebody who has scars or burns. Now, other examples of disabilities that could fall under these categories, uh, like I said, cancer, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, HIV and AIDS, major depressive disorder, and many, many more. Now, next slide, please. We will move to how the ADA is broken down. There are five titles for the ADA. Title I, Equal Employment Opportunity. Title II, Government Services. Title III, Public Businesses and Venues. Title IV, Telecommunications. And Title V, which covers everybody who is using the ADA to file for a claim. If we look at Title I, Equal Employment Opportunity, this talks about businesses who are hiring. And it essentially says people with a disability must be given an equal chance to be hired. Everything from the hiring process to the firing process must be equal. Title II is a similar situation, but for 
people who uh, are in government services. People with disabilities must be given equal access to local, state, and federal government services. And Title II is broken down into two parts, subtitles A and B. Subtitle A covers most of these services, everything from voting to emergency services to public education to recreational activities. Anything that receives government funding, it falls under subtitle A. Subtitle B is specifically for public transportation because public transit systems tend to be complicated and fall under their own jurisdictions in cities. So subtitle B has specific recommendations for that. Title three is access to public businesses and venues, everything from an office building to a cafeteria to a stadium. These also need to provide equal access to people with disabilities, whether you are a for-profit or non-profit entity. Protected categories under Title III include hotels, restaurants, universities, daycares, hospitals, uh, and transportation, any, any other uh, non-government funded public transportation initiatives. Title IV, telecommunications. Now, this one is a little bit different. Title IV specifically has a provision for deaf and hard of hearing and those with speech impairments so that they too can have equal access to accommodations in addition to other disabilities which may not generally be thought of in this, in this vein. Now, finally, Title V, as I said before, breaks from the format we've seen so far and actually talks about the uh, rights and responsibilities of those who are filing for an ADA claim. This essentially limits the ability for people to retaliate against those who are filing against them. And it also says that the courts are allowed to award the fees to whoever loses the case, essentially. That means that if you are going through an ADA suit and you as the business lose that, you may be liable for every court fee. Now, we are going to look at how the ADA has been used from its inception in 1990 to the present day. We're going to start with Supreme Court cases because they're the most influential. The first three cases in 1999 that are most uh, well known are Sutton versus United Airlines, uh, Murphy versus United Parcel Service, and Albertsons versus uh, Kirkenberg. These three cases refined the definition of disability, legally speaking, and allowed people who are using mitigating measures to perhaps deal with the symptoms of a potential illness or disability to not be covered by the ADA. Essentially, if you have medication or technology that allows you to eliminate the barriers to access that a disability would usually pose, you cannot use the ADA to say that somebody is blocking your access because you can have equal access, whereas somebody with a disability cannot eliminate these barriers. The next most important landmark case from the Supreme Court also came in 1999, Olmstead versus LC. This essentially made it illegal to keep a person with a disability in an institution, hospital, asylum, home, et cetera, to receive care. They have a right, just like everybody else, to own their home, to live in their community, to work, to play. And the state, it was found, has the burden to support that. They should provide in-home support. They should provide medical care if they want it to be in-home. This is predicated on if the person with the disability wants it, if their support team agrees, and if it is a reasonable accommodation that the state usually would provide for a situation like this. The next one, Spectre versus, versus Norwegian Cruise Line Limited. Excuse me. This was in 2005. This established the fact that the ADA does have jurisdiction in U.S. waters even to a limited degree on international ships and craft. Essentially, the ADA applies to boats and ships just like it does to physical brick and mortar locations, just like it does to virtual website locations. 2017, we have Fry versus Napoleon Community Schools. This deals with disabled students. It essentially makes it illegal to force a disabled student filing an ADA claim against your university or school to have to go through a, a uh, administrative hearing or tribunal or panel first. Many universities use mechanisms like this to settle legal disputes before they're ever brought to the court. You are not allowed to force a student to go through this. Now, as a side note, 
The access to education for a disabled student is covered under the ADA, but the actual education itself is covered under a different act, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA. That is a whole different conversation. Finally, for Supreme Court cases, we have Hadgerson versus <coughs> Lawfer, excuse me. This is an ongoing case. There is a brief that will be filed, or it is scheduled to be filed, I should say, next week. Now, this hopefully will be a landmark case dealing with somebody's ability to file an ADA claim, whether they have a disability or not. Say you're an able-bodied person who walks into a restaurant. They do not have a way for anybody except a sighted person to read their menu. No Braille menus, no accessible website, no QR code, just a regular menu. You, as the able-bodied person, currently could file an ADA claim, even though you have no disability. The Supreme Court is currently sitting to figure out whether that has any legal ground. Now, we will move to other cases that are not Supreme Court cases, but are nonetheless just as uh, important in establishing precedent. 2000, Bank of America and Florida and California actually came to an agreement rather than a court case in this particular instance. Bank of America agreed to make their websites digitally accessible after going through a long and uh, laborious agreement settlement. Next case, 2006, we had the National Federation of the Blind versus Target. This case was very important because it shows that the Americans with Disabilities Act does apply to digital spaces as much as brick and mortar spaces. Target very, very much argued that this was not the case. And finally, the courts settled in the favor of the disabled people. Because of this, Target wound up having to pay all the court fees, as mentioned uh, as a possibility earlier, and specifically in California, had to pay into a $6 million settlement fund. This is not uh, by any means the first time something like that has happened, but it is one of the cases that people point to in establishing precedent for the ADA in a digital space. 2017 also has a case that's very interesting. This case specifically focuses on mobile applications rather than websites, and it essentially says the ADA also applies in that digital space. Web applications must be as accessible as, as websites, as accessible as stores, et cetera, ad nauseum. The final court case is uh, another one from this year, uh, Rendon versus Barry Global. This is one of hundreds of cases that are currently being filed in what I would argue are bad faith filings. They don't have the evidence to uh, stand on their own. They lack standing, as you would say. And it's slowing everybody down. It's bogging down the system for cases that actually deserve to be seen by judges. So in response, we are actually seeing some legal pushback. For example, legislatures in Kansas have signed an act into law that gives businesses the ability to counter sue in cases if they actually were accessible and were proven to be accessible. They can counter sue to get those damages back from the person who originally filed against them. Only in Kansas and only right now. But if this trend continues, we might see more laws passed just like that. Now we're going to move into some legislation, not all legislation, but some that supports and corroborates the ADA. But we're actually going to start with something that was before the ADA. Uh, the Unrest Civil Rights Act in California was signed 31 years before the ADA was signed. And it essentially does the same thing that the ADA does, but in a broader stroke. It is illegal to discriminate against a person for any reason that we usually think of race, sex, creed, religion, and disability, among others, if you have a customer in California, not just if you're a business, but if you have a customer who is in California, you cannot discriminate. There is a possibility you will be sued under UNRWA. If you violate UNRWA, you're obviously violating the ADA as well, but it's important to know that that case against you could come, that the arguments could come from multiple directions. Now, as we've talked about, the DOJ released guidance yesterday uh, on web accessibility. They also released guidance a year ago, a little over a year ago, in 2022, 
that says the same thing, but it was it was a little less specific than what we saw yesterday. It advised people to use the web content accessibility guidelines to make sure that all of their things are accessible. Now, as I said, the ones released yesterday give you more guidance. So it's glad I'm glad that we have multiple versions of this on the books now. Finally, we do actually have a law that is currently uh, its status is introduced. It hasn't moved. The Websites and Software Accessibility Act would make it legal to follow web content accessibility guidelines in the United States. The European Union has something like this. Australia has something like this. Other countries do too, but we do not. The ADA only lets you defend accessibility in the digital space. It does not say what that accessibility should look like, or it does not, and it does not define best practices. But these guidelines do. They already exist. They're an international standard. We just need legislation to support them. And this brings me to my conclusion, which is we have done a lot in the last 30 years, or if you're looking at the timeline of UNRWA, even 60 years, but we have a lot more to go. We have a lot more challenges to conquer and many more barriers to overcome before we truly see equal access. Thank you. I'm gonna pass it back to Mariella now. Thank you so much, Charles. That was an amazing presentation. Every time I hear you speak or teach, it's like, yes. Next, we have the fireside show with Tony Coelho, the author of the ADA and the former House Majority Whip. And we also have David Marotti, the CEO of AudioEye. Today, the DOJ yesterday released some really great re regulation. Tony Coelho is at the White House and David is really busy with our team figuring out what those legis what those new rules mean. So they're both busy, but we got a fireside chat conversation between them. And we're gonna go ahead and watch that together now. So go ahead and take us away, Mike. Welcome to the Fireside Chat today. My name is David Marotti, CEO of AudioEye. I'm wearing a white polo shirt. I'm pleased to be joined today with Tony Coelho, author of the ADA and former House Majority Whip and a former chairman and current member of the Board of Directors of the Epilepsy Foundation. We are proud to work with Tony as an independent director here at AudioEye. Tony, welcome to the Fireside Chat. Thank you, David. I'm wearing a light purple uh, shirt, white hair, um, and I'm a white male. Thank you so much for that. The first question I have, Tony, is can you share with us your personal experience with disability and how this opened your eyes to a lack of awareness of the experiences with people with disabilities? When I was a young person, David, um, I had an accident on my family's dairy farm, hit my head. A year later, I had a grand mal seizure uh, in uh, the barn that I was milking in. And my parents decided that uh, if you had epilepsy, it meant that you were possessed by the devil. Uh, they uh, were very religious and believed uh, what the church basically was preaching. Uh, I went and had had these passing out spells for a period of time. I went to Loyola University and um, and then I decided I wanted to become a Catholic priest. I was denied entry because canon law said, if you have epilepsy or possessed by the devil, you can't be a priest. I became suicidal. Um, I was fine after that, went on to Washington as a result of living with Bob Hope for a while, uh, his suggestions to get into politics. And uh, then I realized as a staffer that we didn't have our basic civil rights, um, that we could be discriminated against illegally. And so when I became a member of Congress, I decided I wanted to do something about that and worked with the Reagan administration in order to get something done and put in the legislation. And uh, it was uh, a little bit controversial, particularly on the House side, uh, but we got it through. And 33 years ago, it became law. Great. When did you get into Congress to start working on this? I, I got elected in 1978 and started working on this in, uh, I would say, 1981, something along there, that line. And uh, we were able then to get a draft going. And I got uh, Senator uh, Weicker from Connecticut became the 
a Republican Senate uh, sponsor. And so what we were trying to do is to make sure we had a, a bipartisan Democrat, Republican, and bicameral, meaning the House and Senate, so that uh, we covered most of the bases politically. And that worked. And then in the next session of Congress, we got it through. And so it took about nine or 10 years to pass once you got into Congress? When, once I got into Congress, it's actually shorter than that, probably around five years uh, that when we really got into it. Um, and then it, uh, you know, it's major civil rights legis piece of legislation. And it uh, uh, passed. Uh, uh, rather quickly based on that. It uh, took a lot of effort to get it done, but we got it done. Looking back on the past 33 years since the ADA was passed, what do you consider to be the most significant achievements in terms of advancing disability rights and accessibility? Well, the, the, the most important thing is uh, we had a president, uh, attorney general, and the head of the Civil Rights Division and Justice who enforced the law. I mean, uh, the ADA is just a piece of paper and you have to have the government enforcing the law. So that's the most significant thing. You had an administration that was willing to do it. And today that's still the case. So uh, there was just a case filed where it went after a school district that uh, segregated basically young kids with disabilities. And so the government took action on that. So with having a partner like the government that's willing to uh, enforce the law, it is successful. So that has to be the most important thing. A lot of negatives and things that haven't been done, but that is really one of the biggest. Now, the other part of that that's big is that when we adopted, several other countries now have adopted an ADA. Uh, over 52 different countries have a law similar to ours, not exactly, but worldwide, um, compliance uh, to a ADA or understanding that people with disabilities have some rights is now a world issue. And so that's a wonderful, positive thing from the ADA. Definitely. When did they start enforcing the law once it was passed, I believe, in 1990? It was under President Clinton's uh, uh, Papa Bush, basically, as I call him, signed the bill. And uh, then they had staff that was very positive about pursuing it. And the attorney general then, a very close friend, uh, was enforcing it at that period of time. And then when Clinton got in, uh, the uh, attorney general was positive and Tom, Bre Tom Perez became the head of the Civil Rights Division and he aggressively enforced uh, the ADA. That's when it first started being pushed at that time. This is in the 1990s. Right. Yes, sir. Yeah. Great. Uh, can you share any personal anecdotes or stories that have touched your heart and highlighted the positive impact of the ADA on individuals with disabilities? Yes. Uh, so many different uh, people have been impacted positively. Uh, I had a, a, a young uh, fellow who uh, was being discriminated against because uh, he was in a in a wheelchair and used actually a power chair. And uh, the school was unwilling to uh, give him the accommodations that he needed. And, and so uh, he got that. Another case was that uh, I had a, a young lady and a young man, both had disabilities, uh, got them jobs. They didn't know each other. They ended up getting married and have two kids. Um, and so you you have a situation where uh, these people uh, weren't going anywhere without the ADAs being able to support them. And then the enforcement of it, it made a difference in their life. They can be married. They can own a home. They can take care of their kids. Uh, that's what it's all about is giving people with disabilities the opportunity to fail, which means then they get the opportunity to succeed. Um, so that's what's exciting about it. And I see that practically every day. I get uh, comments and words about it. Those folks met at work after they were able to get those jobs they wouldn't have been able to get prior to that. That's right. And, and then being able, you know, both of them have a disability and then having two kids 
and taking care of their kids and they're, they've grown now. Um, but that's kind of exciting. That's what it's all about is that uh, without the ADA, they would not have had jobs. They probably would have never got met, never would have gotten married um, and so forth. So if you take all those things, um, ADA is responsible for that. Those people are paying taxes. Um, and that's what I love. I mean, I love the fact that we couldn't get jobs before we were legally discriminated against. And now um, people with disabilities can get jobs. We need more and more jobs, quite obviously, but uh, can get jobs, can participate in society. Uh, and more important, they can pay taxes along with everybody else. Uh, a lot of people uh, critical and saying, well, it's handouts. No, it's not. They participate, they pay taxes, and they do good work. Yeah, that's amazing. On the 33rd anniversary of the ADA, what do you hope can be accomplished over the next five to 10 years? Well, one of the things that I hope to be accomplished, David, is uh, within the next uh, few months, and that is uh, for uh, all this time, people who are sight impaired, hearing impaired, and physically impaired uh, could not access the internet. And I feel strongly that the ADA covered it. However, some courts have said no. And so we've had this fight. And so uh, over a 13 year period, we've been working to try to get the White House to correct that. And uh, within, I would say within a couple of weeks, uh, that'll be resolved. So after 13 years, um, it's making some progress. What that means is that uh, the people who develop software and so forth have to make sure that that software is accessible. Um, and, and when we went through the pandemic, uh, I think uh, those so-called so able-bodied folks, uh, they had a way to uh, pay bills and, and to shop and so forth all through the internet. Just think of the people with uh, disabilities, they still haven't been able to access the internet. And so uh, that's a wrong, I say it's a moral issue. But I think more exciting about that, David, is that uh, if we do correct this and the internet becomes accessible, just think worldwide, that'll have an impact uh, because people all over the world will be using uh, the internet. And, and so it's not just here in the United States. Uh, that uh, whole effort would have a huge, huge impact. So that's the one thing immediately that I've been working on. The second thing, of course, is jobs, uh, making it possible for people with disabilities to get jobs. That really comes down to the CEOs of, of companies that who say to their people, we want to hire people with disabilities. Um, and But that's a long time effort. We've made progress. Federal contractors and subcontractors now, uh, as a result of an effort I worked on, um, have to hire people with disabilities. So we're making progress. The accessibility part is my big one. Uh, I think that make a huge, huge difference. You've been working on this uh, for a long time. I think you said 13 years and you expect things to change in the near term for the internet as well. Yep, I expect that to work. In a couple of weeks, we'll be able to announce that uh, the rulemaking takes place, and that should be resolved in the next few months, then, where it would be published in the Federal Register, and, and it would be the law of the land. So um, that's exciting. Uh, I don't know much that would stop it right now, David. It seems to me that we're on a path. It was blocked in the White House for all these years, and we're getting that out. Um, uh, and so that's the positive thing. And so I feel good that we're finally gonna be able to uh, make that change. Yeah, this administration seems to be taking it very seriously. Right. Uh, so that's that's great to see. Yeah, the Justice Department has been very aggressive in getting it down. They're the ones that had to do the research, economic uh, consequences and all that stuff and the cost of, uh, as opposed to benefits. They went through all that. It's been presented. Um, they submitted it to the White House. The White House is uh, moving on that. Uh, then it goes through the 
um, all the hurdles that have to uh, be done, but they're not major stops. Basically, it's just administrative hurdles um, to get this done. Well, fingers crossed that that would be amazing for folks with disabilities to be able to really use the internet right. and have that in place. Can you share any insights or lessons learned from your work promoting disability rights and accessibility that you believe would be valuable for future generations of advocates? Well, I think that the internet access is probably the biggest one, um, but uh, also working on uh, making sure that uh, accessibility uh, in uh, uh, transportation uh, and so forth, because it, it's important for those of us with disabilities, a lot of us uh, aren't able to drive. So having transportation to get to a work or have transportation to get to church or, or to get to a store and so forth uh, becomes critical. And so with this uh, infrastructure bill, it's been uh, signed into law this this year, uh, that whole effort also will improve the transportation system. I was just at the White House a couple of weeks ago where the Secretary of Transportation and the Vice President uh, were pushing in regards to getting some of this done. Uh, but that uh, whole effort, which is the law, but implementing now the law uh, is will have a huge impact for those of us with disabilities here in the United States. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, so on some final closing thoughts, uh, what message would you like to convey on this to this audience on the 33rd anniversary of the ADA? And what call to action should we leave them with? Well, I think the most important thing is for those of us with disabilities is to believe in ourselves. Um, we have to, I always like to say, we have to end up loving ourselves because if we can't believe or be positive and so forth, we really can't influence uh, the rest of the world in regards to who we are, what we need and so forth. Uh, so we have to be comfortable with ourselves. That's the most important thing in regards to our whole movement. Um, we also need to make sure our parents uh, give us an opportunity to fail. Uh, again, as I say, if we have the opportunity to fail, we can then succeed. But a lot of parents out of love uh, basically restrict what those of us with disabilities can and cannot do. So it's changing that attitude. And then, of course, uh, the most important thing is getting a job. And so I say to young people, um, uh, be positive, be aggressive, uh, speak up, speak out. Don't be afraid to speak up to power. Um, we have a right to demand and expect uh, that we have a right to participate in society like anybody else. But it's important that we, young and old, we are willing to insist that our rights are there and go after it. I think that's exciting. Um, uh, we're making great progress. Things are turning. And, uh, you know, just a few years ago, uh, people could discriminate against us legally, and now they can't. Uh, but we have to stand up for those rights, just like everybody else has to stand up for their rights. But our community needs to do that as well. Yeah, we made a lot of progress over the last few years, but there's still a lot more to go. Yeah. Well, thank you for everything that you've done for the community, Tony. Really appreciate your efforts on this. You've been a singular hardworking focus on this issue. And I really appreciate this. Thank you, David. It's my ministry and my passion. I just feel I have to pay back for all the positive things that have happened to me. We're making a difference. That's what's exciting. Thank you, David. Yes, you are. Thank you. All right, that was, whoo, that left me absolutely inspired today. Now we've got to close up. So let's go over to the next slide. And if you want to stay connected, if you want to stay in the know on all the things that are happening today and beyond, make sure that you follow Tony Coelho. You can follow Tony on Twitter at H-O-N-T-O-N-Y-C-O-E-L-H-O. 
you can follow David Morati. You can follow David. He actually updated his LinkedIn very recently. So you can just go on LinkedIn and find him at LinkedIn, David Morati. You can follow Charles Heiser. You will go on LinkedIn, C-H-A-R-L-E-S-H-I-S-E-R. -S -S -E and you can follow me on LinkedIn at M-A-R-I-E. L L A Paulino P A U L I N O. And you can also follow the Audio I company account by going on LinkedIn forward slash company forward slash Audio I dash I N C. And with that said, we are all done for today's webinar. I hope you have a fantastic July 26th. 33rd anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and we will stay in touch. Until next time, bye-bye.